one of the things you do brilliantly in this book is while there is lots of tech and there's this thriller taking place, this is really a story about the most disruptive technology of all, which is empathy, yeah. which is this capacity with, of empathy and what it can be used for and against, right? That's sort of this bigger story that's tucked inside of this book. And you asked this great question, which I think people should really think about. You ask that the, the um, who's the character that asks this question? He says the question about improving upon nature. It, is it uh, you're talking, it's No, it's Chang Z. It's the bad guy in the last, in the final speech in the book. Right. But then you start to think, is he the bad? I mean, I guess well, he's, a, whole, he's right, any bad the, guy, that, but that, like that's you, the, that's uh, another no, part of my crisis. I, well, I, I, most of my characters tend to do a lot of things, right? They invert on themselves yes. a lot. You, they start out one thing, they become something else, um, especially in this book. Um, and that, that in this book, that's very intentional. But I, the bad guy does ask questions about, is it important to improve life, right? If we have genetic technology, um, should we improve up, upon life? And what's interesting about this question is- it, Here's asked, how you phrased it. Okay. That humans have a moral obligation to improve on nature. That's a huge proposition. Well, and I, again, put into the mouth of the bad guy, who I might know. not be entirely the bad guy. But um, the my my point on that thing on that is so what. And I God, I don't even know how to give this away. But um, I know it's so. We're hard. talking about removing humanity's violent instincts from the gene code. So let's just put, let's put it there. Um, and those start to become hard and uncomfortable and weird questions that you, you know, most of us have two or three or four answers to, and I have no clear way to get there. But like what I was going to say earlier is here's something that you probably don't think about, but so I was in, uh, I'm one of the organizations that I do a lot of work with is the Lab to Land Collective. It's a synthetic biology approach to forest health and catastrophic wildfire. And I was at a meeting there recently, and it's DARPA is involved in a bunch of top geneticists and genomicists at top labs. And when they talk about restoration ecology, like we're going to restore the landscape to how it originally was, when? Is the question that you have because it was a very different landscape 100 years ago 200 years ago a thousand years ago ten thousand years ago and which one is natural is a really weird question in restoration ecology and how we think of, so it's not just we're going to change the species going forward but we're making like weird sort of decisions going backwards too and that's what i mean by like the questions that are coming are really complicated like the ones we're looking at now are a lot simpler and this the stuff that come that's coming gets really complicated talk a little bit about your whole thing with empathy in this book like give people a sense of the role that empathy plays here I, I mean, I, you know, the book is just a call for empathy for all, right? It's extending empathy to, for plants, animals, and ecosystems, and all humans and all plants, all animals, all ecosystems. And I think that is the shift we need to make as a world in order to actually solve climate change, to solve species die up. When we think about plants, animals, and ecosystems, when the forests are our family, right? We do, we go to extraordinary measures to protect our families. And that is, I mean, if you look, even if you look at like some of the brilliant, like John Doerr's recent book, Speed and Scale, which is a really great detailed fight climate change plan, really good. The amount of effort it's going to require, right? When Peter and I wrote Abundance and I was really interested in using tech, that disruptive technology in Abundance and Bold to solve environmental challenges, we said, look, we have the tech to solve the problems, but it's going to require the largest cooperative effort in history. And that's like all human beings working together in flow, right? Performing at our best to solve these challenges. And I wrote Abundance and wrote Bold 
and I saw humanity pick up the mantle on poverty and energy scarcity and health care and education. All of the human challenges got solved, but the environmental stuff sort of got pushed to the wayside and nobody really was using this technology, right? It, it didn't even matter. Like I'd written a bunch of books about it. I kept trying to like get people to see this problem. And I started to realize that like people literally are not seeing and perceiving the natural world. I was, you know, it didn't matter how much I talked about it or shadow, like there was a, a literal cognitive bias. There was an information processing problem. So how to bridge that gap to get a plan like John Doerr's speed and scale or a plan like Peter and I laid out in abundance or anything like that actually going, um, you have to massively expand our sphere of caring in, you know, you need cross species and empathy. And that means empathy is how you expand empathy, right? It's one of, it, it just grows it. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.